Can you hear me okay? All right, good. So several weeks ago, I was driving north on 43. It was kind of a cloudy, overcast morning. And I hear a little voice from the back seat. Mom, I've been thinking. Now, when my four and a half year old son, Paul, says that, I truly have no idea what he is going to say next. <laughs> His little brain is still this strange, unfolding mystery to me, and I just never quite know what's going to come out of his mouth. So I look up in the rearview mirror, and I see him staring at his hands. He's looking at them front and back and just staring at them. And he continues, Mom, I've been thinking. Do you remember that time last spring when we went to that Milwaukee Day party and there was this really hot glue gun and you said, do not touch that? And I started playing with it and I burned myself really badly. And I'm sitting there thinking, uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that pretty clearly, Paul. But I just kind of nodded and looked at him and he's staring at his hands. And he continues, and yeah, and do you remember that time last summer when you were at that meeting in Sheboygan and you had to drive home really fast an hour because I was in the emergency room with dad after I cut myself and I was trying to cut that bell pepper when dad told me not to touch the sharp knife and I did and I'm like, yeah, I also, I also happen to remember that <laughs> horrible <laughs> experience as well, but you know, I don't say anything and I just sort of nodded and I'm watching him in the mirror just staring intently at his two little hands. And he says, well, I've been thinking, I'm fine now. It was totally worth it, <laughs> right? <laughs> it was totally worth it. The risk was totally worth it. I'm fine. I mean, it hurt for a little while, but, but now I'm fine. And so I'm just driving along on 43, and I'm like, OK. And of course, I'm frantically imagining this future vision 10 years from now where he's like, and I was totally fine, Mom, <laughs> right? Um, and I just thinking, how am I going to respond to this? And you know, I tried to remind him, well, there are these scars on your hands. But you know, he just wasn't hearing any of it. And what struck me in that moment was how really serious he was in talking about this. He was so proud that he'd put these events together and was making sense of this play, he was kind of making sense of his world through these experiences that he had and understanding the consequences, or in his mind, lack there of consequences of this play that he was doing. And I was reminded of you know, Piaget, the psychologist who tells us that in the 20th century told us that play is the work of childhood, right? When children are playing, they're working and they're learning and they're understanding the world and that that work is pretty serious work. That's how they make sense of things. And as a mother, I know that to be true, that play is very serious. I know that also when I remember my own childhood games, which I took very seriously, but those are other stories for other days. And I also know that as a scholar, right, I research the history of childhood, I write about the history of childhood, and I know very well that play and games and toys, yes, tell us a lot about children's experiences, but reveal a whole lot about larger cultural patterns. Things that might be hidden, things that we might not know right away or think about right away, but they're important cultural tools. And play is very serious. And when you walk into an exhibition like Serious Play with a child, they know that serious play isn't an oxymoron. It's not a fun title for an exhibition. Play is serious. And not just in the way that the designers who are talked about in that exhibition learn to create interesting and innovative designs. It's serious because it really is cultural work. So when I walk through that exhibition, which I have done many times, and there are a lot of beautiful, delightful, fascinating things in there, I imagine those little hands in the rearview mirror, maybe opening the colorful furniture designed by Henry Glass, or building their own little house of cards, or playing with some of those interesting tops or blocks or forms. Serious play, allowing someone to learn about the world. But there's also play in that exhibition that's not just serious, that I think of as maybe grave, that I think of as maybe troubling. Play that I might not want my child to be engaging with. When I look, for example, at that small little totem pole, which when I first saw it in there, it was really shocking to me that it was just sort of sitting there. How do we think about ways in which people play with other cultures, right? What kind of power dynamic does that object suggest? A totem pole 
is supposed to be an object that's about a community or a clan story. It's not a toy. Or what kinds of play were designers engaging in in the mid-20th century when they were collecting the works created by artists from Mexico or Peru or Honduras or India and bringing those objects back together again as a playful or whimsical, the word that's often used, contrast to shiny Alcoa aluminum to create a different vision of corporate America with those objects, playing with those objects, playing with the concepts that those objects represent. There's, there's play and there's a game, but the rules aren't fair to everyone in that context. And those games can maybe get us to think about power and creativity, consumerism and modernity, and who is viewed as having access to those concepts and who is not in that world, in that exhibition. So that day when I was driving up 43 and taking my son to school, when we got there, um, I didn't go right into the carpool line to drop him off, but I you know, pulled into the parking lot and I said, okay, I'm gonna show him these scars on his hands. I'm gonna help him try to see, like, okay, actually there was a cost to that kind of more dangerous play that you were doing. Just like there are these cultural costs and there are these cultural scars when those kinds of um, games are being played with people's stories and objects. And I tried to show him, but he wasn't interested at that point because in his mind he'd already created a story that was meaningful to him about what had happened. He had taken these chances and he was fine, no problem, right? He wasn't interested in that story anymore. But that doesn't mean the scars weren't there. And that doesn't mean I didn't know that they were there. So, thank you. <laughs>